Good morning. We were changing the cycle of readings this morning for a special festivity. We're in the book of Revelation. God's temple in heaven was opened. Isn't that what the sunrise does in a certain sense every morning? It opens a reflection of God's, of God's temple, of God's, where God is. The whole world. Obviously the book of Revelation is on a different note, but analogically, God's temple is opened up. And there we're looking at the sun. And here we're going to be looking at the moon in a second. It's still on its course to set. It's a waning, a full moon waning. If you missed the videos the last few days, you can see the, well, actually they were on Instagram, I'm sorry, about the moon rise. I didn't put them on Facebook. That was an extra for the Instagram followers. So we have God's temple. We use that sometimes for a building that we make. But the building God made, what glory is in his building. And then we have, obviously, the temple in Jerusalem. A great sign appeared in the heavens. And that's another temple. And you are temples of God. This is St. Paul's language. And God lives in you. The Holy Spirit has been poured out into our hearts, the love of God which we have received. Destroy this temple in three days, I will build it up again. There are a number of major principles to understand scripture right. And we've often mentioned one about whole context. You can't just take one line and isolate it from the rest of scripture. You can receive good inspiration from a line for sure great inspiration God gave his only son to redeem us so much did he love the world in John chapter 3 so these lines are very very powerful the word was made flesh and dwelt among us that one line can cause us to to have an extraordinary uh, an extraordinary sense of awe. Or the very first line of John's Gospel, in the beginning was the Word. How that brings us to deep reflection. But the whole context brings a lot of light when we see scriptures in its complete context. Then another principle is that there's a progression in understanding. God is preparing a people. A people that will be ready to receive his son. A people for the salvation. And God has done all of this for us and for our salvation. God didn't need to do it. He did it out of pure love for us. That was his whole purpose. So all the mysteries are for us. God didn't need to come down and do some little theatrics and some little show. He didn't need to put on a show for us. It's for us and for our salvation. So all the mysteries of Christ's life 
also have that dimension to them. And putting in this whole context from Genesis to Revelation, there's an extraordinary story about us. It's a story about God. It's a story about God's love for us. When Jesus did the resurrection, it wasn't just like to make a point that he was not conquered by death. It was to say, you're also going to rise from the dead. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he wasn't abandoning us and say, okay, now you get on with the show. He's saying, you're coming with me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. We think of Abraham and Moses and Elijah and all the prophets and the great figures of salvation history, the role they played preparing a place for Jesus to come. Imagine the love that Abraham receives today in heaven. The glory. And Moses. And they're just the ones gone ahead of us. And we're all called for that glory. And that's the mystery we celebrate today when we see that woman clothed in glory. that spouse of the Holy Spirit dressed in beauty, the beauty of grace, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And then we read the book of Revelation, chapter 11, chapter 12, a great sign appeared in the sky a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And here we had the sun and the moon today. I'm just standing in the wrong place for the moon now, just in case you joined later. Here we have the sun. And in half, well, 20 seconds or 30 seconds, I'll give you the moon. All in one shot. And the moon is still very bright because of the waning full moon, which is always up this place, right here between the roses. And the moon is reflecting the sunlight. And that became a great image of the church itself and also of Mary, the mother of Jesus, because she's reflecting the light. She's the one at the light source, the light of the world. And that light affects her just like the light affects the moon's surface and reflects down to us here. And so we have the moon and the sun. And the light reflects off the lake. You could even get light reflecting off stone. Off sand, and there we have the mirages that fooled many a traveler in the desert. But it reflects, it really reflects. And today we're looking at that reflection. Imagine the reflection of God's light in the eyes of every baby that's born. Reflecting at God's light in the joyful eyes, eyes of the very elderly person who's still filled with faith and hope and love and know they have a destiny awaiting them in glory. So the mystery of the assumption that we read about today, that we pray, that we celebrate, is a mystery that's for us because we're called to heavenly glory. Nothing less. We're not made just to be a consumer. We're not made just to have a nice Mercedes or a palace or the most spectacular silk clothes with embroideries that are out of this world that very few queens have been able to dress. We're made for a very, very different, a different level of fulfillment which eye has not seen and ear has not heard which the Lord has prepared for those who love him the queen stands at your right hand arrayed in gold 
All these words ring in the believer's ears as they ponder the mystery of Christ. And little by little, as we become more civilized by grace and leave our barbarian uncouthness and no longer murder, no longer indulge in selfishness, but little by little are shaped and transformed into the image of Christ, we begin to see the mysteries better. And that's the whole path of the church through the millennia. The mystery of the Trinity could not be formally announced almost 300 years, over 300 years, well, about 300 years. The mystery of, of the dignity of the human person, how long it took, because we were so capable of trampling on the human being, how long it took. How much patience God has with every saint. I'm reading a very fascinating book right now, and it's somebody discovering Jesus and coming to him and accepting him. And it started when he was eight years of age, and Jesus was never mentioned in his home, never. And his family was super secular. And he has gone through so many curves, I'm about uh, not quite two-thirds of the way through the book, well over halfway. And one of the things that's fascinating me is the patience of God walking with somebody. And this person was very good, really. This person wasn't an evil person. He didn't do evil deeds of hatred. And yet he has a whole long path. And the church is still on this path. And the Lord will still shower bountiful grace and insight on the church as we live in the middle of the struggles of our times in every generation. And the truths of our faith enlighten us and become so significant for us in valleys of darkness and death and violence and wars and evils and selfishness. The queen stands at your right hand and reign of God. What are the fruits of that? One of them are that we realize that our bodies are temples of God. And that we're destined for glory no matter what our aches and pains are and frustrations and anxieties and depressions are at the moment. That we're made for eternal glory despite the poverty, the misery, the migrant situation, the burned house through a forest fire, the flooded fields destroying the crops. We're made for glory and we cannot give in. For people in depression, or their families that are helping somebody in depression, to realize this mystery of the assumption of Our Lady, we are all called to the same glory. Christ didn't take off on his own in the ascension and stay gone and, you know, there's little hope for us, not much more than these birds here on the tree. You know, try and get a little heat from the sun while we can open up our wings. Try and find some bit of fish for breakfast. Have a couple of eggs, have a little nest, raise young ones and then die off. No, we're made for eternal glory. The fruits of chastity for our bodies, to treat our bodies with the respect and modesty which they deserve, and which our society refuses to give, it trashes the human body. And it trashes the bodies of others in the media, through all the tools of wonderful media and all the production of trashing of the human body, of total disrespect. The trashing of people when they refuse asylum the trashing of people subjected to violence. We need to contemplate this mystery. This mystery gives us hope. Not only did Jesus rise from the dead, we are all called and will rise from the dead and will be in eternal glory, seated at the throne of God. Perseverance during all kinds of difficulties, the care people give with such care to the most decrepit and degenerate people, physically degenerate with 
leprosy, with cancers, with crippled with pain, morally degenerate people, we'll still treat them with respect and care. Criminals, we'll still treat them with respect and care because we want them redeemed. We want them sharing the glory with us that we don't deserve either. That's total gift, that's total grace. People, there's a lot in this great feast for us today. May you be blessed and enjoy it and prepare for the fullness of grace that will be gifted to us when our life closes in fidelity of our, in our path in this world as we cry out, Lord, have mercy on us and Lord, I hope in you. Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I love you. See you later, alligators. Have a great celebration today.